morning. Lord Jesus, we do thank you for this morning that you have given to us, for the ability to come to this place and to celebrate, to celebrate you and what you have done in each of our hearts. And so, Lord, we pray as we open your word and as we look at this text that you will, you will speak to each one of us and that we would truly understand what a magnificent Savior you truly are. So, Lord, we take these moments and we ask for hearts and minds that are focused upon you and allowing your spirit to speak deeply into our hearts and minds. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. When was the last time you were really, really disappointed? You know, maybe you ordered something on Amazon and it got all five stars and it, it came and, and after a couple months though, you were just really disappointed. It didn't measure up. It, it wasn't what it was advertised to be and it just did not work well at all. Or maybe you found a new friend at work and you thought, man, this person's really neat. I enjoy being with them and maybe I can build a relationship here. Friendships are hard to come by, true friendships. And yet after a few months, you realize this person really isn't interested in a friendship. They just want to talk about themselves and tell you about their problems. And there's a, there's a sense of disappointment that settles in because you would hope for so much more. It's kind of funny, but I remember a big disappointment when I was in high school. Class rings aren't that big a deal anymore, but when I was in high school, you ordered a class ring. Um, it didn't matter who you were, what you had to do, you found the means to order a class ring. We would order them in the uh, spring of your junior year, and so I can remember my dad had a beautiful class ring he still wore, and I wanted one very similar to it. It was gold, it had a garnet stone in it, and it was beautiful. Like I said, he still wore it even many years later. And so I was working at Winn-Dixie at that point, and I saved all my paychecks for three months and all my tip money, and um, you got to order it, you got to design it, each one was unique, it was your ring, and so I designed this ring, and I think it was like $500. $600 when it all said, that's a lot of money for a high school kid back then, but you ordered a class ring. That's what you did. And so we ordered it that spring, and then the following year, your senior year, about midway through the year, the rings would come into the school. And so you would go to your homeroom class, and the rings would be distributed, and you'd put them on your finger. I had little fingers. It looked like wearing an Easter egg, but you wore it with pride. I mean, this was your ring. And so everybody's walking around school kind of holding their hand out. So everybody, see my ring? You okay? And, and you, you didn't say it, but you wanted everybody to see it. Of course, they couldn't miss mine because it looked like an Easter egg. So that went on for about two months. And one night at dinner, I was sitting there, and my dad, and I was kind of showing him the ring, and we were looking at him. And all of a sudden, I noticed, wow, Dad, the stone in your ring is a lot richer and deeper and brighter. Why is that? And he goes, oh, Ray, he says, this, 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 is, a, this is a real garnet. Yours is, yours is synthetic. Synthetic? You mean like plastic? Well, yeah, what did you think? Well, I thought it was a real rube, a garnet like yours. And, and, and it, it, it just kind of took the air out of me. I was really depressed. I was disappointed. I had worked hard. I'd saved a lot of money. I thought what I had was genuine, and it wasn't. I think it was the first semester in college that class ring ended up in a dresser drawer, like many class rings. Uh, Marlene pawned hers so she could attend Moody and help pay for it. A few years after we were married, Marlene took that original class ring and also my grandfather's wedding band and had them melted together and had this ring designed, which has a lot more meaning than that class ring ever did after that. So there are times in life when things just don't measure up and we're left disappointed. And I think to understand the events of Holy Week, you, you have to understand some of the irony of what's going on and the disappointment because of misplaced expectations. People were willing to settle for less and they missed the best. So with that in mind, let's take a moment and let's look at the text together. I chose to go to Luke chapter 19. The worship team read it a few moments ago. And let's just walk our way through here. If you've been in church for a while, you're familiar with this text. But let's look at it with fresh eyes this morning. 
Luke chapter 19, beginning down around verse 28. And when he had said these things, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem, and he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany on the mount that is called Olivet. Those two towns are about a mile apart. They're just to the east of Jerusalem. Bethany was the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, whom if you remember, Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. And Jesus had already set his mind several weeks before toward Jerusalem. Luke 9 says that he he set his face to go to Jerusalem. He knew full well what awaited him there. He, He knew the task that was before him. And so he's, he's working his way to that holy city to once and for all offer himself as the Messiah to the people. And it continues there with the um, end of 29. He sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. Now that's a funny verse. If someone came to your house this evening and knocked on the door and said, I need to borrow your car, the Lord has need of it. You would probably think a a, a kook has shown up at your door and you would say, no, no, thank you. But I don't think that's what was going on here. Jesus had taught in Jerusalem. He had performed miracles in the area. He was well known. When they said the Lord has need of it, my assumption is the person knew who they were talking about. If Ashley came to your house tonight and says, Pastor Ray needs to borrow your car, eh, one or two of you would probably say yes anyway. But there's a difference. There's a a relationship. You know who I am. They knew who Jesus was. And so, sure, bar the colt. It's okay. And then it comes down to verse 32. And so those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owner said to them, why are you untying my colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus and throwing their cloaks on the coat, they sat Jesus on it. This kind of introduces the first, to me, the first great irony in this holy week. Roman historians have recorded that Jesus' entry was not the only entry that was occurring on that day. That actually the governor of Judea, Pontius Pilate himself, he comes up towards Jesus' trial as well. He himself led a great procession into the city on that very same day. Rome had defeated the Jewish nation some 80 years before. Uh, The Jews lived in subjugation to the Roman authority. And there were always rumors of uprisings. There had been uprisings in the past that Rome had to put down. And and Pilate understood at this moment the significance of Passover, this Passover celebration, when thousands of pilgrims would come to Jerusalem to celebrate God's deliverance of the Jewish people from Egypt. And he didn't want anyone getting any ideas that this was the day to revolt. So Pilate himself comes into the city with centurions and with horses and with chariots. He himself was going to make sure no one revolted even in this high religious holiday. One writer says, imagine this scene. From the western side of the city, the opposite side from which Jesus enters, Pontius Pilate leads Roman soldiers on horseback and on foot. Each soldier was clad in leather armor, polished to the highest possible gloss. On each centurion's head, hammered helmets gleamed in the bright sunlight. On their sides, sheathed in their scabbards, were swords crafted from the hardest of steel. And in their hands, each centurion carried a spear, or if he was an archer, a bow with a sling of arrows across his back. Drummers beat out the cadence of the march, for this was no ordinary entry into Jerusalem. 
Passover was a Jewish celebration of their liberation from Egypt many years before. Pilate understood this symbolism. Pilate's entry into Jerusalem was meant to send a message to the Jews and to those who might be plotting against the empire of Rome. The military spectacle was meant to remind the Jews of what had happened the last time a wide-scale uprising had broken out when thousands had been killed. It was meant to intimidate the citizens of Jerusalem who might think twice about joining any such rebellion. So you see there were two processions on that day. Pilate's was one of intimidation, of fear, of military might and power. Jesus revealing humility, peace, servanthood, and salvation. Jesus came riding in, not on a chariot, not on a horse, but on a donkey. Now, that doesn't mean a lot to us, but in biblical culture, for a king to enter a city riding on a colt or on a donkey means he comes in peace. He's not coming with war. He's not coming to bring judgment. He's coming to bring peace. And so Jesus comes in bringing peace. At that moment, he's also fulfilling specific prophecies spoken of him thousands of years before. Zechariah 9.9, you'll recognize the imagery. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation as he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The people understood Zechariah chapter 9. They knew that that chapter spoke of God's deliverance of his people. And at this moment, they're thinking, could it possibly to be that the day is the day and that Jesus is the one? The problem was one, though, of misplaced expectations, wasn't it? They were anticipating a military deliverance. Someone to throw off the yoke of Roman rule and allow them to thrive as an independent, self-governing people, bringing back images of what we've been looking at, of the kingdom under David and Solomon when Israel reigned throughout the known world. That's what they were thinking. Misplaced expectations so strong that they were missing the greater reality concerning who Jesus was and what he was offering. And thus they ended up very disappointed. They thought they knew what they wanted, but they were missing what they really needed. Jesus was offering so much more than just a political king. He was offering a spiritual savior. My first year of college, first semester actually, when the ring ended up in the drawer, I call it my Jonah experience because I went to East Tennessee State University to study engineering. But I knew what God really wanted me to do, but I thought, I could outmaneuver him on that one. It lasted about a semester. I ended up coming back home, and Marlene and I were already dating at that point. I'm like, well, the time she hears that guys call me to be a pastor, she'll be done with me. Who wants to be married to a pastor and go through that? So I told her, and I told my parents, I had no idea. I had no idea where you went to school for training. I didn't know what you took. I didn't know what, it was just, so whatever. So I went back home. And enrolled at Central Piedmont Community College. Took some general ed classes. because I, I needed time to get my feet under me. Well, how do you do this, Lord? This is kind of new. Now, usually when you think of community college, you think of easy classes and sliding on through. Not that difficult. Um, I found Central Piedmont to be incredibly good. Uh, they had some incredible teachers. Um, they I saved a lot of money by going there. And so I went there for two years. And I still can remember things that I learned while I was there. One of the best teachers was Miss Rouser. She was a retired public school teacher. Her husband had worked with the Manhattan Project, and she had a lot of stories, and she just loved history. 
But Miss Rouser had a way of teaching history. History wasn't just names and dates and events for her. History was understanding what was going on in the culture, in the mind, in the context in which these events occurred. She helped you think through history, and all of a sudden, it made so much more sense. Events don't just happen in a vacuum, do they? And so I had her for two semesters. And I still remember the one day that she introduced us as young college kids to this idea of frame of reference. And she says, all of us have a frame of reference or a lens at which we look through to see the world. And each of our lenses are a little different. It's based on the way we were raised, the experiences that we've had, things that we've done. And it's, it's, it's our way of looking at the world around us. It's why we have two political parties today with very differing views on the very same issues. It's because of the frame of reference with which we come to those issues. And she spoke at that how our frame of reference slants and, and, and dictates the way that we look at events around us. For the Jews here in the first century, their, their frame of reference was being subjugated to, from under Rome for so many years. The inability to, to govern themselves, the inability to, to rule and to do as they please, that was their frame of reference. And it was so powerful and so strong that they were missing what it was that Jesus was coming to offer. All they could think was for political freedom. But Jesus was offering something much greater, not a military leader, not a king, but a spiritual redeemer. Verse 36. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. And as he was drawing near already on the way down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works they had seen. In other words, this was not just a little fringe demonstration of a few hundred people. Remember, Jerusalem is packed. If you were Jewish, you went to Jerusalem at Passover. So you had all those people coming in. You had all the merchants coming in selling animals to be sacrificed at the temple. You had all the people coming in selling the trinkets just like we do today. Of, of, remember your trip to Jerusalem, 2017. They were selling the t-shirts. and all. So the place was packed. People were sleeping on the hillsides in tents. There wasn't room in the city itself. And here Jesus is making his way down off the Mount of Olives and, and this mass of people are beginning to push in just for a glimpse of this one whom they call Jesus. And they're saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace on heaven and glory in the highest. You see, they fully expected Jesus to come as a king, like David or like Solomon. This is the promised one. Their frame of reference was so skewed that they missed the salvation he was bringing. Verse 39, and some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, and he says, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Another irony here, the Pharisees, the religious teachers, the pastors of that day, the very ones who knew the scriptures inside and out and should have been able to correct their view of what was going on, who should have been able to speak the truth. And they're jealous. They're jealous. They, they view this Jesus and his many followers as, as one who is, is going to usurp their power. And they tell Jesus, shut them up. Make them be quiet. Tell them to go home. And when he drew near and saw the city, and this is another incredible irony, don't miss it here. When he drew near and saw the city, he wept over it saying, would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make for peace. In other words, 
A king is not going to bring you the peace you desire. The king of kings can bring you eternal peace, but you're missing that. But now they are hidden from your eyes, for, for the days will come upon you when your, your enemies will set up a barricade around you and surround you and hem you in from every side and tear you down to the ground, you and your children within you. And they will not leave one stone upon another in you because you did not know the time of your visitation. Do you catch all the irony going on at this point? Rome is strutting around like it's the almighty power as Pontius Pilate comes in to the western side of the city with might and force. We are the power in town. <laughs> and Jesus, the very son of God, is riding in a colt through the eastern gate into town. The religious leaders, the, the ones that should have brought corrective view of what was going on to, to, with Jesus' arrival, had missed it totally and, and were consumed with jealousy and pride and arrogance. The people want a military king. Jesus is coming as a spiritual one offering salvation. The crowds are amassed and they're pushing in, all just wanting to catch a glimpse of this Jesus. And yet in a few short days, many in this crowd will also be the very ones who are saying, crucify him, crucify him. Because he didn't measure up as a military king. And finally, in all the celebration, it says that Jesus wept. All the people, all the joy, all the exuberance going on around them. And at the very center is Jesus on this colt being led into the city and he has tears coming from your, his eyes and you would have to wonder, what is going on here? His heart is broken. He sees the truth concerning just how lost the people were. They were so blinded they could not even see the truth. They could not see the truth concerning their lostness. They could not see the truth concerning the salvation that he was bringing to them. When he looks up and he sees the people, he sees needless hurt and pain of sin. The broken hearts, the broken relationships, the exhausted, hypocritical lives from trying to be good enough, the burden of those trying to live under the law, the guilt, the pain, the shame, and the hurt that always goes with sin. Jesus wept. Because the people were lost and in bondage to the sin and they could not even see the truth. Five short days later, as Pilate attempts to calm the crowd by releasing a prisoner, he presents to them Jesus. And you know the story. All the crowd could say was crucify him. Crucify him. Crucify him. Jesus had failed to meet their frame of reference. Jesus had failed to fulfill their idea of a king. Jesus became a disappointment to their low standard and they turned on him. Every one of us here this morning, likewise, must make a decision concerning this Jesus. A few weeks earlier, Jesus, in a quiet time with his disciples, had asked them, who do the people say that I am? Remember, at this point, he had been teaching, he had been working miracles, he had sent the disciples out, he was known and they replied, John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. Obviously, there was a lot of confusion about who Jesus was, just as there is today. 
And then Jesus turns to Peter. He asks that all important question. But who do you say that I am? That's the big question, isn't it? Really doesn't matter what the people say. What do you say in your heart that I am? And Peter replies, the Christ, the son of the living God. He got the words, and I think his life continued. He began to understand exactly what that meant as well. Jesus came as a spiritual savior. That was the need of the people. He didn't come to make them comfortable. He didn't come to make them rich. He didn't come to make them privileged. I look at the church today and I see many people who seek a Jesus that basically will make them comfortable. That's what they want. They give him little thought until life begins to become overwhelming and messy. And then they desire a savior. Not necessarily a spiritual savior, but a, a savior that will come in and save them from their pain. Who will save their job and fix their kids and replenish their bank accounts. And then as the crisis fades, they simply fade away as well. Having never really encountered the Jesus who loves them and desires to save them. No, Jesus came as a spiritual savior on that first Palm Sunday. That was their real need. That is our real need. To save us, to free us from our sin, the darkness, the bondage that sin brings into each of our lives. To free us from cold, empty, religious practices of simply carrying out religious duties like attending church and giving money just because it's something that we do without any heart. He came to release us from the demands of the law and legalism. To free us from our own pride and self-serving arrogance. To save us from ourselves. Because in reality, we are our own worst self-enemy. To give us new life. Life in him. Life with purpose, with meaning, with real peace. And to give us a certain hope. That's why he came. So we each have a choice here this morning, don't we? We can settle for less and ultimately be disappointed when it doesn't measure up. Or we can look to Christ, the Son of the living God, the saving one. Let's pray. Father, this morning, just like some 2,000 years ago, you invite us to come to you. To lay down our guilt, to lay down our shame, to lay down our sin that holds us in bondage and darkness and uses so much of our energy. To lay it down and come to you and find life. And Father, there may be some here this morning who have never made that decision. May they know that you come not with condemnation, but with a loving heart to forgive and to bring new life. May they receive that this morning. I pray also this morning for those among us who maybe are believers. Maybe they've been believers for 10, 20, 30, 40 years. And they find themselves trapped in sin this morning. Father, may they too know you come offering freedom. That you are coming towards them, not in condemnation, but in love. Father, may their hearts be open to the truth of who you are and what you desire for them. 
Father, we pray that your spirit might have your, have your purpose and your means within our hearts and with our minds. Father, when people look at us as believers, may they see you. May we walk humbly with you. And may we always be thankful and grateful. May we see the true reality of who you are to each one of us. May we not settle for anything less. For you are the King of kings and Lord of lords who loves each one in this room more than we can possibly imagine and has secured for us a salvation which is beyond imagination. You come and you bring us life, abundant life, eternal life. And we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.